I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files, true stories of encounters with Bigfoot. Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. We are located on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and are interested in hearing of any encounters or sightings from here on the island. If you've had an encounter or sighting, please give us a call or text us your experience at 778-227-7588. If you've had a sighting anywhere else in Canada or the U.S. and want to tell us your story, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. Thanks. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Sasquatch in British Columbia, Part 9 1961, April 19th, Harrison Hot Springs, Puzzling Print Mrs. Jerry Starry reported that she found a large human-like footprint near her home about six miles from the Harrison Hot Springs Hotel on April 19th, 1961. She found it while walking her little girl to the school bus. The print was on the gravel road leading to her home. It measured about 12 inches long and 10 inches wide at the toes. Mrs. Starry stated that she had heard unusual noises outside her home on the previous night. She also said that a broken teacup was taken from her garbage can overnight and carried it some distance down the road. There was only one clear footprint impression. However, other indentations that might have been footprints were observed. No print indications were found leading to the road, which might indicate a hoax. 1961, September, Cumberland, seemed to be checking where they camped. Bill Winnig reported seeing a strange creature near Cumberland in September 1961. Winnig and another youth had camped for several days on a sandbar at the head of Forbush Lake in the Puntledge Valley. As they were leaving, Winnig looked back and saw an animal walk out of the bush on two legs onto the sandbar. It squatted, stood again, and then walked into the forest. It was dark-colored and had no neck. Winnig remarked that it seemed to be checking the sandbar at the spot where the two had camped. 1961, October, Nelson, silhouetted in the moonlight. John Bringsley, who reported seeing a Sasquatch near Nelson in Kokanee Glacier Park in 1960, had another sighting here in October 1961. He had gone to the area with another man hoping to see another Sasquatch. At midnight, they saw the upper body of one of the creatures silhouetted in the moonlight. It was in the trees, just short of where the trail went out onto open rock. Bringsley estimated the creature was seven to eight feet tall. 1961, October, Swindle Island, Long string of large footprints. Bob Titmus, who was researching Sasquatch with funding from oil millionaire Tom Slick, reported finding a long string of large footprints on a small island offshore from Swindle Island in October 1961. He saw the tracks with binoculars from his boat, and there was no way to get ashore other than to swim. Titmus stripped off his clothing and did just that. The tracks were about 13 to 13 and a half inches long and approximately 6 inches wide at the ball of the foot. The stride, or pace, was about 4 feet. Some of the impressions were quite deep, although he could see that the creature was only walking. The tracks came out of the water and angled toward the timber and undergrowth. They paralleled the growth line for about 125 feet and then entered it. He stated that the tracks appeared very similar to 14-inch tracks that had been found in California. He was unable to spend a great deal of time on the island due to the cold weather and for fear of his boat breaking anchor. 1961, Morristown. Prints were awe-inspiring. A couple sitting down to breakfast at their residence about four miles south of Morristown reported that they watched in amazement as a Sasquatch strolled by during 1961. The creature, which they described as about eight feet tall, black, hair-covered, very heavy, and with a flat face, walked erect across a field and then across the highway. 
After it left sight, they inspected its path and found 300 yards of five-toed, flat, 16-inch long footprints that sank four to five inches deep in the field. The depth of the prints, compared to their own, was awe-inspiring. 1962, April, Bella Coola. Four Sasquatch seen together. Harry Squinnis reported that while camped with his family near Bella Coola at Anaheim Lake, Goose Point area, in April 1962, he observed four Sasquatch. Squinnis said that the couple's baby was crying, and he saw a head and forearm come in through the tent flap. The creature had a monkey face, but its head was bigger than a human's. Also, the arm was covered with long, dark brown hair. Squinnis grabbed for his flashlight and gun, but the flashlight was not working. At the same time, the creature wandered off. After leaving his tent to investigate, Squinnis threw gasoline on the campfire, and in the bright flare, he saw four of the creatures. They raised up after laying face down on the ground at the edge of his camp area, about 14 feet from his tent. They all walked slowly away, walking like men. All were about 8 feet tall. Squinnis called to them, Hey, what are you doing out there? Hey, come back. However, the creatures just kept walking away. He thought that the reason one of the creatures peeked into his tent was because his baby was crying. The next day, Squinnis found big finger marks in the dust on a poplar tree with its bark skinned about eight feet up. This is an interesting account from the standpoint that a crying baby was involved. There are a number of incidents in which Sasquatch are apparently attracted to children. The creatures simply stand and watch the children at play. In Russia, there's an account of a mother who left a baby to fetch water. The baby apparently started to cry, and when the mother returned, she found a female almosty cuddling her baby. Perhaps something like this could happen with a Sasquatch. I have mused that a setup along the lines of the Squinnis experience using a recording, just might attract one of the creatures. 1962, April, Bella Coola, Mother and Child A young woman reported that she spotted a Sasquatch mother holding a child by the hand on the banks of the Bella Coola River, right in Bella Coola, in April 1962. The woman was out walking with her own two children when she saw the creatures, Word was also circulating in the little town at about the same time that other people had seen the mum at night. Sasquatch sightings of a lone creature are by far the norm. However, it stands to reason that those solitary big guys were once toddlers, and this is a little proof. 1962, June 8th, Kitimat. About ten apes. A commercial fisherman reported that he saw about 10 apes near Kitimat on June 8, 1962. He at first said they were apes, but later changed his story to bears. However, bears don't usually come in such large numbers, and we have to wonder if bears would have greatly shocked the man, although I think 10 would have been at least a surprise. 1962, July 23rd. Wells, light gray animal. Alec Lindstrom and friend George Bryant reported a long-distance sighting of a strange creature in the Wells area near Stony Lake on July 23, 1962. The men were in a boat on the lake when they saw an erect light gray animal standing on the shore more than half a mile away. They said it looked to be between 9 and 10 feet tall and very heavy. They went towards it, and it eventually turned and ran into the trees. They observed the creature for about six to ten minutes. 1962. Aristizabal Island. Many tracks found. Bob Titmus reported that during the summer of 1962, he found 1,200 yards of bipedal tracks, much larger than normal human tracks, in deep moss on Aristizabal Island. 1962, August, Devastation Channel, pace of 42 inches. Bob Titmus reported that during August 1962, 
he found flat 14-inch tracks with a 42-inch pace in a creek bed on an island in Devastation Channel. 1962, August. Hickson, hair-covered man. A woman stated that she saw a tall, hair-covered man near Hickson in August 1962. She said he was about seven feet tall and covered in black hair. The oddity came towards her as she was walking along a local creek. When he noticed her, he jumped into the bushes. 1962, August. Quinnell, small black eyes. Mrs. Calhoun reported seeing a man-like creature between Quinnell and Prince George, Canyon Creek area, in August 1962. She was on a prospecting and fishing trip, and while waiting by the creek for her daughter to return with lunch, she heard a noise behind her. Thinking her daughter had returned, she turned to speak to her. Instead of her daughter, about ten yards away, there stood a hairy, man-like creature. She had a hunting rifle and quickly positioned it for self-protection. Fortunately, the creature simply stared and then retreated to the bushes. Reflecting on the incident, Mrs. Calhoun stated the following. My first fleeting impression was that it was a human with very long arms, but it took me weeks to get out of my mind the look it was giving me from its small black eyes as it stood there. It was like an ape, but like a human as well. It had blonde brown hair on its chest and long, loose, matted hair on its head. It had high cheekbones, a wide, flat nose, a forehead that sloped back, and a mouth that stuck out. It opened its mouth but didn't make a sound, just stood there looking at me. I started to move away and the thing jumped into the bush and disappeared. All the time as I was backing off down the creek, I knew I was being watched. Mrs. Calhoun later said that the creature had something around its waist, animal skin or garment, she couldn't recall. 1962, Swindle Island. Three sets of tracks. Bob Titmus reported that during the fall of 1962, he found three sets of tracks, about 14, 13, and 12 inches long, on a Swindle Island beach. 1962, November, Chilliwack. Eyes glared. Joe Grigg, a Pacific Stage Lines bus driver, reported that he did a good turn and saw something very unusual near Chilliwack, Vetter Crossing area, in November 1962. He had returned to his depot late at night with two soldiers on his bus, and there was no one there to meet them. Greg was going off shift, so he gave them a lift in his own car to the army camp at Vetter Crossing, CFB Chilliwack, which was not far out of his way. As he drove home towards Yarrow, in heavy rain, he saw what he thought was a very big man in a fur coat standing on the edge of Vetter Mountain Road. In Griggs' own words, And then as I got close to him, I realized it wasn't a man or anything I'd ever seen that looked like one. And when he looked at me, my headlights hit his eyes and they glared. Then he slowly kind of half walked and half loped across the road, and I kind of turned my car and followed him with my headlights. Then he stopped along the edge of the road and looked at me for a second, and then jumped up onto the bank. Grig, who during this time was 20 to 25 feet from the creature, said it was about 6 feet tall and did not have clothes, just quite long hair all over its body with a reddish glow. He estimated the creature's weight to be well over 400 pounds. When asked about facial features, he stated, I saw a part of his face when I was right close to him, very ape-like, flat nose, some of it quite hairy, and a very thin-lined mouth. The one outstanding feature is, I didn't notice any ears. The only other thing was the lack of a neck. He had little or no neck at all. After the creature was out of sight, Grig marked the road shoulder with his foot and returned the next day. He noted that the oddity had risen over six feet, later measured at seven feet ten inches in its jump, and landed on a large rock at the bottom of the bank. 1962, December, Bella Coola, four sets of footprints. Bob Titmus reported that while driving across the high plateau above the Bella Coola Valley, 
in Tweedsmere Park in December 1962, he found four sets of adult Sasquatch footprints that crossed the road. The tracks were in very deep snow and the weather was very cold. This finding appears to be a bit of a record for Sasquatch prints, which are usually the result of one or two individuals traveling together. 1962 Bella Coola, Million Dollar Reward In 1962, or earlier, Tom Slick declared he was willing to pay a $1 million reward for a Sasquatch, dead or alive. It appears he made the announcement in Bella Coola. Slick had been earnestly seeking the creature since 1959 and had a number of men in his employ scouring forests in the Pacific Northwest. Although it is common knowledge that Life magazine offered a $100,000 reward for a Sasquatch, dead or alive, in the late 1960s, Slick had previously offered $1 million, according to Cliff Coppice of Bella Coola. Unfortunately, Tom Slick died on October 6, 1962, so it is doubtful that the offer was valid for very long. Nevertheless, it was an indication of what one could possibly get for a Sasquatch. It appears, however, that Slick's offer was not made public until 1967. The 1967 Real West magazine article on the offer refers to Copus as mentioning it in a recent edition of the British Columbia Digest magazine. Oddly, in the Real West article, the offer is talked about as still being valid, which I'm sure was not the case. 1963, July, Kamano Titmus sees unusual figures. Bob Titmus reported that in July 1963, he observed three brown figures as they climbed a cliff south of Kamano. Titmus was about two miles away, but he could see arm and leg movements like those of humans. 1963, Price Island, Sasquatch Roofed Nest. In the summer of 1963, Ray Roberts and his wife found what appeared to be a Sasquatch nest on Price Island. The couple were walking the shore, beachcombing for glass fishnet floats, when they noticed the strong smell of something rotting at the forest edge. They continued walking up the beach and found a large nest-like structure of grass and other vegetation within a crude shelter of poles and other driftwood, just above the high tide line. The nest was at least eight feet across, and the low entrance of the structure faced the forest rather than the beach. There was a substantial roof of poles and logs. Humans were eliminated as a possible explanation because of the remoteness of the area and the strong smell. 1963, Bella Bella, seen on shore. Jack Wilson reported that he saw a big, erect, hair-covered animal on the shore of an island near Bella Bella in 1963. Wilson related this information to Bob Titmus. 1963, Minstrel Island, Monstrous Thing A man reported that he saw a monstrous thing on a shore near Minstrel Island during 1963. He was in a rowboat traveling to the flats at head of Thompson Sound and apparently saw the creature in a stooped position. He said he saw the creature get up on its hind legs and move off erect. The man was so astounded with what he saw that he reported the incident to the BC Provincial Museum in Victoria. 1964 Squamish Very Large Tracks a man and his wife reported that they found a long line of large, naked foot tracks in snow north of Squamish in the winter of 1964. The tracks were apparently made by a bipedal animal. The man said that the tracks were half as long again as his size 12 rubber boots. The couple followed the tracks but apparently did not see what had made them. 1964 April, Tumour Island House moved. Ellen Neal reported that people in a village on Tumour Island said that a Sasquatch had approached a house there in April 1964 and shoved it partially off its foundation. It is said the creature pushed at a corner of the house apparently with enough force to move the structure. 
The man who owned the house said that he had seen just a bear in the area. However, it was noted later that he cut down all the trees around his house. 1964, July, Chilliwack, Four White Dots Five people reported that they saw two unusual creatures near Chilliwack at Cultus Lake on July 3, 1964. The group was driving on a dirt road around 2.30 a.m. looking for a place to camp. They saw four white dots up ahead, and as they passed, the dots turned out to be the eyes of two seven-foot-tall creatures, one heavier than the other, both covered with shaggy dark hair except on their feet. The creatures stayed on the road and kept walking as the group went by, but turned their faces away. The driver turned around for another look, and the creatures stepped into the woods. After this experience, the campers were so shaken that they drove to Chilliwack and parked in a school ground for the night. 1964, Agassiz, Tracks with Short Toes Mr. and Mrs. Robertson found large unusual footprints near Agassiz on Herling Island while out rock hunting in about 1964. The island is located across the Fraser River from Agassiz. The prints were 14 inches long, 7 inches wide at the widest point, and had short toes. They were found in sand along the island's shoreline. 1965, May 31st, Mission. Cows stared at it. Mrs. Seraphine Jasper reported that on May 31st, 1965, she saw a Sasquatch near her home in the mission area, Nickelman Island. The creature was in a pasture with cows. She stated that it was large and covered in black hair. It had appeared from nearby bushland. She said that the creature kept moving around and the cows tended to wander over and stare at it. She became frightened and left, so did not see the creature leave the area. Mrs. Jasper was an elderly lady and had a superstitious fear of bad luck on seeing a Sasquatch. As a result, she did not watch it, just glanced toward it from time to time. 1965, June 28th, Squamish, something dragged to an ice hole. Two brothers, professional prospectors, reported that on June 28, 1965, while traveling on foot at about the 4,000-foot level near Squamish in the Garibaldi Park area between Pitt Lake and Squamish, they found some fairly fresh and very unusual tracks in the snow. The prints were enormous, 22 to 24 inches long and 10 to 12 inches wide. They were perfectly flat and showed four clear toe impressions with the big toe on the inside of the foot like a man's. The stride or pace was double a man's stride. Snow at the bottom of the prints was tinted pink. Parallel to the tracks were three grooves in the snow. The prints were widely spaced from side to side, and there was a wide but shallow drag mark running along between them. Outside the line of prints on either side, but close to them, were narrower, deeper grooves. The snow was old and hard, but both the prints and the outer drag marks sank in about two inches. One of the men sketched all this in his notebook on the spot. 1965. They followed the trail up the valley until they came to a small lake that was still frozen over. The tracks led out on the ice to a place where a large hole had been made with the broken pieces of ice lifted out and piled around. There were footprints but no drag marks leading away from the hole. It was later reasoned that humans would not have had the weight or strength to make the tracks or drag anything heavy enough to make the drag marks in the snow. Baffled, the men went on around the side of the lake until they noticed in the trees on the other side a human-like figure standing and watching them. It was auburn in color except for its hands, where the color lightened gradually almost to yellow. It had a human-shaped head set directly on the square shoulders, and its forearms and hands bulged like canoe paddles. It was swaying slightly, as if shifting from foot to foot, and its hanging arms swayed as well. They couldn't make out its face because of the distance, but the features seemed flat. 
It was just noon, and they sat down and had a cigarette and a chocolate bar while they watched the figure and tried to estimate its size. Counting the sets of branches on the evergreens where it stood, and comparing them with those on the side of the lake, they decided it was between 10 and 15 feet tall. It just continued standing there, so finally they went on. When they came back later, there were more tracks around, but the oddity was gone. The following day, after climbing over the ridge onto a plateau, they came to some very small lakes where there were a lot of smaller tracks, so old that all that was left of them was compacted snow sticking up above the level of the melting snow around them. Some of the prints, however, were reasonably clear. They were 18 inches long, and they led out to a place on one of the tiny lakes where the snow had been pushed back, and a hole more than five feet wide was made in the ice. Other smaller tracks about 10 inches long did not go out on the ice. A few days later, one of the brothers went back to the spot in a helicopter with a newspaper reporter. They photographed the big tracks in the valley, which were badly melted out. They then found some fresher-looking tracks on a ridge, but could not land there. These tracks led to the edge of a cliff with no snow down below it. This is one of the most unusual reports ever submitted on Sasquatch experiences. John Green thoroughly investigated this incident and concluded that the men did see what they claimed to have seen. He and Rene de Hinden even flew over the area to see if they could see any ice holes, checking every lake within 50 miles of the area. However, they did not find any. At the time, the report was not made widely known. However, about two years later, September 1967, the brothers met with B.C. Recreation Minister Ken Kiernan and told him of their experience. It was at this time that the B.C. provincial government expressed interest in the Sasquatch issue and appealed for anyone with tangible evidence of the creature to come forward. On September 30, 1967, provincial anthropologist Don Abbott stated that this sighting was the best account so far received of the Sasquatch. At this time, the brothers said that the tracks they found in snow looked similar to those photographed in Northern California in late August 1967. The fact that the print showed only four toes is unusual, but not unheard of. From my own research, I have concluded that this happens sometimes because the little toe fails to register as deeply as the other toes. It is not subjected to the same weight. Skamania County, Washington, 1993 I've got one for you. This is a true story. During the summer of 93, I owned five acres in the Cascade Mountains of southwest Washington in Skamania County. The area is rather remote, with very few people living up there. Most are a quarter mile at the closest to neighbors. I was outside in the yard around dusk playing with my daughter and my gray wolf dog when the neighbor's dog, who lived farther up the canyon that he used to hunt bear, started to make more noise than usual. As I listened to them, there was this very loud, growling, howling scream that was unlike anything I have ever heard. It made the hairs on my dog's neck stand up on end, and mine too. All at once, the canyon was dead silent, which is very unusual being in a canyon. Even the most slightest noises seemed to echo down the canyon, and on the air was this horrible smell that I would relate to something dead mixed with a very musky smell. As I told my daughter to get in the house, I noticed that my dog was cowering under the house and refused to come when I tried to call him in the house. Living in the mountains in such a remote place, it is not unusual to see and hear mountain lions, black bear, puma, elk, and the like, and I am familiar with the sounds of these animals. My dog had chased without fear, or sense I should say, all of the animals above, and he has never cowered, even when he was charged by a bull elk during the rutting season, until that evening. That was the quietest night that I have ever experienced there. Not the usual dogs barking in the distance, but dead quiet. The only noise I heard was the occasional crashing and breaking of wood, like something big was about in the woods. I'm not saying what it was, because I didn't see it. But to this day, in my mind, I know what it was. This memory will be with me for the rest of my life. Name withheld by request. The Pete Luther Story 
by Vance Orchard. Bigfoot, Sasquatch. People occasionally ask me such questions as, you don't really believe in those things, do you? Or they might ask the same thing, but in a more equitable fashion. Do you believe in Bigfoot? To which I reply, in the face of all that I have read and see, I find it extremely difficult not to believe in the Bigfoot phenomena which is by way of leading you into a highly interesting conversation with a man who gave me my introduction to the Bigfoot story. Seventeen years rolled back the calendar the other day when I responded to a note on my desk after coming back from some surgery. It was to renew acquaintance with Everett Lee Pete Luther, the man who had put me onto my first Bigfoot story. Luther has put on some paunch and some gray hair, but who among us had not in the past seventeen years? but is the same eloquent guy I had met in 1966. A construction worker living in Walla Walla then, Luther had an affinity for riding his motorcycle over the roads of the Blue Mountains. It was on such a journey up the Mill Creek Road that summer and nearly to the mouth of the Tiger Creek that Luther spotted the huge footprints in the roadway. With the help of another cycle rider who happened along, but whose name he never got, Luther hauled out a tape and measured the prints. They were 19 inches long and 8 inches wide, and it was 5 feet between each of the footprints. Bigfoot aficionados will be nodding their heads at this point, as those stats are fairly typical of many Bigfoot Sasquatch footprints. The Luther sighting was a year before the movie was filmed by the late Roger Patterson of a big, hairy, human-like creature in Northern California. When I visited Luther the other day, he recalled Patterson came over here from his home in Yakima and inspected the prints with Luther. A rainfall the day before had damaged the tracks, but Luther says Patterson felt they were authentic. Luther has since then followed his trade and returned to Missouri, but is now again living in Walla Walla, Washington, coming back here this past summer. It was because of the 1966 association and his reading about Paul Freeman's reported sighting of a Bigfoot creature only a few miles from his track sighting, that he was moved to contact me and recount another Bigfoot experience. It seemed a bona fide and hair-raising Bigfoot affair as I heard what Luther and his son Everett related of that experience two years ago in the boot heel of Missouri. Luther and his son, along with his nephew and brother-in-law, were hunting in the St. Francis River bottomland in southeastern Missouri in Dunklin County, an area known as Parker's Island not too far from the town of Cardwell, Missouri, when suddenly his hound started running a trail. He took it across the river bottoms about a half mile. Water was about waist deep to chest deep in some places, as the dog almost got out of hearing range, Luther related. We decided we would walk the level bank about a quarter mile to where he had reached the edge of an island about 800 acres in size. When we were about 300 feet from the dog, we smelled a peculiar odor that almost made us sick to our stomachs, an indescribable odor. The dog was still running in water off and on and ankle deep to waist deep, and he would run in dry parts of the swamp off and on. He would sound at times as if he had it treed or bayed. Knowing my dog, I could always tell when he treed, but that night I could not tell for sure. We stood on dry land and listened to him, at times, it sounded as if the quarry was trying to get him. The way the dog's voice sounded, at other times he would be running it. My nephew and I left my son and brother-in-law in the dry field where we had been standing and went to see if we could find out what the dog was running. We entered about 400 feet deep into the woods, still on dry land. Then we heard sounds we had never heard before. Kind of like a whimpering sound at times, a low sound, similar to a bird or a low muffling sound. It sounded at times like it was 50 or 60 feet from us. As the dog went deeper into the woods, we tried to follow, wading in water almost waist deep. The dog sounded as if it had it treed, and as we approached, we heard sounds like it was behind us. The dog picked up the scent again and headed the same direction the sounds came from. We decided then that it was time to leave by making a circle to where my son and brother-in-law were waiting. When we reached them, we decided we would let the dog run the quarry until he gave up or caught it. He ran it for six hours that night, baying it, and it sounded as if he was treed at times. Finally, I called him off and we went home. 
As the Luthers made their way back to the truck, another event occurred which possibly was linked to their earlier experience. I was putting the dog in the back of the truck. My son and brother-in-law were standing in front of it. Suddenly, my son said, Somebody is crossing the road. I asked, Who is it? They said it was somebody about seven feet tall or more and must have weighed three to four hundred pounds. My son says he walked bent over like a gorilla, pausing for a couple of seconds, and then went off again. It was a moonlit night, and they had a good view of it. Luther says big tracks were sighted two nights later on the riverbank while on another hunt. They looked to be about 12 or 14 inches long. The heel was narrow and the toes kind of pointed. I never knew of any bears or alligators being in there. The tracks were embedded in the mud. A few months after the weird chase in St. Francis River Bottoms, all actors in the drama suffered strange illnesses, including the dog, Luther said. Three months later, I got something wrong with me. It was hard for me to breathe. My body felt like it didn't have much strength. My son, who is in good health, had the same symptoms. My brother-in-law, about five months later, went to the hospital where they had to strap him down for a week, and five or six months after the incident, my nephew started feeling bad and started doing things that didn't make sense. My dog had always been good-natured, but five months after the chase that night, if anyone would get close to where he was tied up, he would try to get them, once even lunging for the throat of a friend of my son's. After hearing the Luther account of their adventures in southeastern Missouri, I combed my files of clippings at home and ran across an interesting account of another Bigfoot monster in Missouri. The clipping has a date of July 7, 1972, and tells of the sighting of a 6-12 to 12 foot black-haired beast that frightens young girls picks up foreign cars, and smells awful, according to the United Press International News account. Although 25 men searched the hills near the town of Louisiana, Missouri, there was no trace of the thing which walks erect and has the town's 7,000 residents worried. A 15-year-old girl told police that she looked out the window of her home to see a tall, hairy creature peering back at her from behind a tree in her backyard, and another girl said it watched her walk home from drill team practice. Could these creatures reported some 200 air miles north of Luther's Bigfoot be the same one? Vance Orchard, 2005 Nighthawk, Okanagan County, Washington, 1944 Rummaging around in old files, I found this one unusual report about fighting from a man by the name of George Brousseau, who claimed his grandfather, Elliot, told him about an encounter with two Sasquatch due west of Nighthawk, Washington, off what is now Log Camp Road, or near there. This was during the war, 1944, when the Giants would come down across the border from Canada in late summer. Grandfather Elliot was on leave from the South Pacific, hunting with some old buddies for fresh meat, which was rationed during wartime. They hoped for a deer, but would settle for a rabbit or a couple of wood hens, whichever came first, when they happened on a terrible ruckus. They saw two big hairy males, each with their hands clasped together in club fashion, using them as weapons on one another, swinging their arms and clasped hands with full force, knocking the other down until both were on the ground trying to get to their feet. They were making groaning sounds, not screaming, just sounds of intense effort being launched at each other with each swing. The object of the disagreement appeared to be a dead deer, where at one point the bigger Sasquatch, approximately seven feet tall or better, picked it up and swung the dead deer full force into the side of the face of the other hairy one, who was probably six and a half feet tall, felling him to the ground. He didn't move. He laid there, his chest heaving. The other Bigfoot stared down at him for a few minutes, as if waiting for the fallen one to get up. Then as the downed hairy one tried to get back to his feet, the winner took the deer and headed off into the trees. The dust settled and the other one got to his feet and trailed after the other one. It was all over in a few minutes. Brousseau's grandfather said there were other stories from the area, but none so violent or as terrifying to watch as this one. 
Brousseau said his grandfather remembered hearing about those big men that would come down from Canada and dive in for lunker bass around Palmer Lake, especially when the bass were spawning. This is all I remember of his sightings. G.B., Washington State, 1995. Lewis County, Washington, Chehalis Raymond Region, January 1, 2010. My wife and I belonged to the same band together, and on New Year's Eve we did a gig in Elma, Washington. We could not drink alcohol, so we drank free Red Bull all night long. After the show we could not sleep, so we drove through Raymond, Washington, and headed for Chehalis, Washington, for no reason. We were just driving around and drove past Rainbow Falls, and we were way out of the way of people, and we pulled over to go urinate off the side of the road. It was very dark in the spot we were in, but I could hear some kind of water-like sound, maybe a waterfall of some sort. My wife came running around to the side of the van where I was standing, just outside the door, and jumped in the door and yelled, Let's go! The reason was very scary to think about, even now. What we could hear was the worst screams that anyone could ever make. It was like a woman being murdered, but, and I stress this, if someone was asked to duplicate this scream, I don't believe a human could do it. It was so scary. It was no animal I have ever heard. The screams were long, and it would take a breath to begin screaming again and again without stopping. I wanted to help this person, but I realized we could be in danger here, so I drove a long way to the nearest store and called 911. A policeman arrived, and I reported it. He said maybe a coyote, but I said no, and I think he thought I was crazy. I said maybe a Sasquatch. We refused to go back there even though he did not ask us to. It was such a scary scream, we had to force ourselves to not talk about it again because it was too scary to remember in my head. I did look up Sasquatch screams, and there was a guy with the same story from December 26th that was just a few days before when we heard it, and there was a male scream I found that almost duplicated what we heard. I do wish I could have seen it, but as I said before, at the time I had to think of my wife's safety first. I do believe that that is what we heard, and I don't know, maybe it was warning us not to get too close. It was approximately 5.34 a.m. New Year's Day when this occurred. I hope I will one day see a Sasquatch. I would never harm them in any way. Russell Wilson, Friday, June 4, 2010 The David Mills Story, Kitsap County, Washington, August 11, 2001 Forest Manager Sees Sasquatch After a forestry manager reported seeing a creature in June, Suquamish police told him there had been several reports lately. As a forestry manager with the Suquamish tribe, David Mills knows his way around the woods, and he was positive that what he saw there one day in June was a Sasquatch. He was checking out some young trees northeast of Indianola and kept hearing a noise in the woods, but when he turned, he wouldn't see anything. Then the hair on the back of his neck stood up. I watched this hairy thing on two legs, he said. The thing used its left arm to lift up a branch, and then it walked about 50 feet. He turned in my direction and saw I was watching him, and he ducked behind a tree. Mills snuck into the tree line and moved closer to the creature. It started screeching and pounding on the back of a tree with what sounded like a rock, he said. He kept trying to get closer, but the Sasquatch would make a ruckus every time he took a few steps. Then he heard the woofing and jaw smacking he recognized as a bear to his left. As he moved, he realized he'd come within 20 feet of a bear cub. The mother bear came out of the brush, but she ignored Mills, an odd move for a bear with a stranger between her and her cub. Her anger wasn't directed at me, it was coming to the right, at the noise it was making behind the tree, he said. With two bears and a Sasquatch nearby, Mills decided it was time to call it a day. I flew down that hill, he said. Then I hopped in my truck and locked up the gate and left the area. The creature, he says, was a Sasquatch, was about nine feet tall and had black, shiny fur all over its body, Mills said. The screeching sounds it made matched those he's heard of a Sasquatch recorded years ago on the Lummi Indian Reservation near Bellingham, he said. 
The Sasquatch also looked like the other one he says he saw while working in the Olympics for the National Forest Service in 1995. It was kneeling by a creek when he and another worker came upon it. The Bigfoot took one look at them and disappeared in two steps, he said. All you saw was a blur of its legs, he said. His partner saw exactly the same thing, Mills said. When he reported his June sighting to the Suquamish Police Department, an officer told him he wasn't the only person to see a Sasquatch in the area lately. He declined to give out the names of the others that have seen it, but offered to pass a message along. The other reported Sasquatch seers did not respond to the request for an interview. When Patrick Julian heard Mill's story, he headed straight to Indianola to see for himself. Julian, who lives in Port Orchard, is a volunteer field investigator with a Boffle group. Many Bigfoot reports turn out to be bears, stumps, or humans, he said, but he could tell Mill's experience had the ring of truth. David was very credible, Julian said. He sees bears back in the woods, he knows the difference between bears and Bigfoot. Plus, there was a footprint. The Sasquatch didn't leave much trace in the dry soil, but he happened to step in a muddy patch on his way uphill and leave one partial track, Julian said. The track was seven inches wide, which would make his foot 15 or 16 inches long, he said. Another Bigfoot track from Kitsap County is on display at the Bigfoot Museum. It was taken three miles from Lider Lake in the summer of 1984. Julian said he doesn't get many reports of sightings in the immediate area. He's heard about Sasquatch screams near Long Lake and gotten one report of a Sasquatch near Gig Harbor. Most recently, a sighting classified as possible was reported near Discovery Bay this March. Julian is hoping other people will contact him with reports of Kitsap County sightings. What I'm looking for is people who are afraid of ridicule and persecution by other people, he said. They're usually afraid to say something. I want to find out if there are people out there who don't know who to contact or are afraid to come forward. Lately, Julian has been spending weekends in Eatonville, where there's been a lot of Bigfoot activity, he said. He also drove to the Lower Ho Indian Reservation on the Olympic Peninsula, where a man reported finding Bigfoot tracks. Investigators there found three sets of tracks from an alleged Sasquatch with 11, 15, or 17-inch feet. They were able to follow one set to a patch of matted grass where they believed one Bigfoot slept, Julian said. He still came up short of his ultimate goal, seeing his first Sasquatch. That's the downside of a well-publicized investigation like the Ho Tracks, where Seattle television camera crews came in and ruined the peace and quiet a Sasquatch seeks, Julian said. That's usually what happens when all of a sudden a bunch of people walk in, he said. For that reason, he's respecting the Suquamish tribe's wishes and leaving the Indianola site alone. Otherwise, he'd be camping there, searching for hair and droppings, and hoping to attract a Sasquatch to his campfire. But the last thing he wants is to bag a Sasquatch trophy. We're on a peaceful pursuit, he said. We're not out to harm anything. Rolf Johnson, the deer and elk manager with the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, said the department occasionally gets reports of Bigfoot, although it has never had one from Kitsap. The most recent one came in two years ago. A man brought in some alleged Bigfoot dung he found near Mount Rainier, Johnson said. He passed it along to a veterinarian who analyzed the sample and found it inconclusive. When people report a Sasquatch to the department, they usually want to see it protected, he said. I just tell them the Department of Fish and Wildlife has no jurisdiction. Johnson said, it's not classified as wildlife in this state. The Sun newspaper of Bremerton, Washington. King County, Greenwater, Washington, September 2001. This story is true. It happened in September of 2001 in the mountains near Greenwater, Washington. I was camping with my girlfriend and her two kids overlooking a small lake from above on the ridge line. From our camp, we could see down to this small lake and see Mount Rainier behind us in the other direction. It was about 1 a.m. the second night we were there when we were awoke by the sounds of crashing through the forest. I remember that whatever it was, it sure made a lot of noise. It scared us all pretty good. I thought that it might be a bear or an elk at first making all that noise, and it got quiet, so we all settled back down for some sleep. 
About 10 minutes later is when we could actually start to hear strange vocal noises from outside near our camp. I exited the safety of our pickup camper with a 1 million candle power spotlight in my left hand and a fully loaded 40 caliber Glock in the other. I scanned the area around camp with the spotlight and saw nothing. I then threw some more wood on the fire, which was down to a glow by now, and went back inside the camper. I assured everyone that it was probably just a bear looking for a free meal and crawled back into bed. Once again, within about 5 to 10 minutes, we could hear noises that resembled grunts and groans and sometimes a sound like a horse makes when it snorts. And it was close. My lab was now cowering under the dinette bed. My girlfriend insisted that I go out and chase off whatever it was because it's starting to scare her and the kids. Not to mention that I too had hair standing up on the back of my neck. This time, I put the Glock in the holster on my hip and secured the spotlight to the barrel of my 12-gauge with electrician's tape and exited the camper. This time, I decided to venture a little farther from camp to get a better look in the trees above us. I had that spotlight virtually scanning a 360-degree pattern the whole time. Now, this is one very bright light and will throw a beam of light for at least 100 yards, even in the black of night. As I got closer to the tree line, I suddenly noticed two eyes glaring back at me from the trees. By now, I had flicked the safety on the shotgun to the fire position and was ready to defend myself against whatever it was. I decided to get closer still, thinking I had encountered a bear. I was right up to the tree line by now, my light scanning everywhere at once. I then heard the vocal noises again, followed by several huffs like a horse makes. Then all of a sudden, and without warning, it starts to move through the forest, making more noise than a herd of buffalo. My spotlight was now trained on the right spot. I saw two huge eyes glaring at my light, now through the darkness, only about 50 feet away. I hear a loud roar as it starts making its way in my direction. This thing was huge, and it made so much noise. It only took a few seconds for me to see what I was looking at. I swear that this creature was as wide as it was tall. I cut loose with the 12-gauge and fired three rounds from a distance of maybe 40 feet. It made even more noise when it turned and started running downhill and away from me. I emptied the clip from my Glock as it ran away. By now, the girlfriend and kids are freaking out. My girlfriend wants to know what I shot at, and I couldn't answer. I just threw our stuff in the camper, and down the hill we flew. I consider myself to be of sound mind and body, and I know that what I saw could only be this legendary creature. I am not with that girlfriend anymore, and I believe that my encounter with the creature is the reason for our breakup. To this day, I still see her from time to time, and I never told her what it was that I not only emptied my shotgun, but the 11 rounds in my pistol on. I have never been back to that camping spot either. I do believe that all shotgun blasts probably hit home as this thing turned and run away from me downhill, and it moved really fast. It was only loaded with birdshot and probably only pissed this thing off. The amount of noise it made crashing through the forest is something I will never forget. The spotlight was attached to the shotgun barrel, which I had dropped when I grabbed the Glock. I emptied the clip, firing through the darkness at the movement as it ran away. I doubt that any of the pistol rounds had any effect, as it was basically spray-and-pray fire. It still gives me the chills every time I think about that night. My trusty lab is getting older now, and even though I don't have the girlfriend and kids either, Duke still sleeps under the dinette when I go camping somewhere. I have not been back to the site since, and I often wonder if I could find any physical evidence after about five years. A friend of mine seems to think that we should be able to at least recover the three shotgun shells and empty 40 caliber rounds from the area. I'm thinking that there should also be some evidence, such as broken branches and such. However, if I ever do return to the spot, I will definitely not be alone, and I will also be more heavily armed than I was that night. I bought an SKS rifle from a friend several years ago that came with two 40 round magazines. Now that the federal ban that was imposed by Bill Clinton is over, I want to find some high-capacity mags for my Glock, too. And if I ever do decide to go looking for this guy again, maybe invest in some night vision and heat-seeking equipment as well. I was a Cub Scout. Be prepared. Tim Kirk, 
February 21st, 2006. I have to apologize about not posting my sightings sooner, simply because most folks just laugh and look at you as a fruitcake or something. However, this makes my second sighting of a Bigfoot. My son and I was bow hunting in Reynolds County, Missouri, and I decided to hunt a pond where deer was using it consistently. To make a long story short, I got settled in a tree behind the pond where I could watch a hauler leading up to the pond and a log road running past the pond as well. So around 5 p.m. I noticed how quiet the woods became. The squirrels I had been watching disappeared. The birds became silent. So I started to become concerned of human activity. So I began to search the woods to see if someone was in the area when this large black figure appeared walking down the other side of this hauler I had set up to watch. At first I thought this was a man. But as it kept walking, I noticed how massive it was and all of a sudden it stopped and took two steps backwards and turned and looked straight at me. It was then I realized that this was not a man, but a Bigfoot. As this creature looked at me, I could clearly see its eyes and nose. I could see flesh around its eyes and cheeks and also see hair covering its face as well. It stood there looking at me for I guess a good 15 or 20 seconds, then turned and walked down the ridge and disappeared into the woods. Needless to say, I was scared out of my mind and refused to climb down the tree, but it was getting dark and I knew I had to meet my son back out on the main road. Finally, I got up the nerve and came down. So I walked over to where I saw it and looked back to the tree I was in, and then it became clear that what I had seen could not have been a man, because he would not have been tall enough to have been seen over the underbrush. This creature was at least seven and a half feet or eight feet tall. When I met up with my son, I asked him if he met or passed anyone or vehicles on his way to pick me up, and he said no, then I told him what I saw. My uncle, son, and I saw a Bigfoot in 2015. Around 2007 or 2008, a hunter told me and my uncle he saw a creature eating a deer gut pile there. BFRO investigator Carter Bouchard interviewed the witness. I spoke with Tommy at length. I was the investigator on his original report a few years back. The encounter was as he described, and I did get some further information from him. It is as follows. He was in his portable tree stand about 30 feet up a rather large sturdy tree. The tree overlooked a trail, hollow, that meandered through another large stand of trees, and the trail, or hollow, dumps out into a clearing. As mentioned, he was focused on two squirrels playing when he heard a rustling, shuffling coming down the trail. Distance from the tree he was in to the spot of seeing the creature was about 75 yards. The creature was blending into the shadows from the trees, and that is where he came up with the coloring of a very dark brown or blackish. He saw the massive creature walking down the trail, and as soon as it hit the clearing, it stopped dead in its tracks and looked straight up at him. It did not stop and look around in any other direction or at any other animals or objects. Straight at him, as though he knew he was there the entire time. This totally unnerved him, and he froze. He was quite certain he was frozen already, and the creature was drilling a hole right through him with his stare. He described the creature as a flat nose, but not totally flat. Flesh was a dark tan, like a white person with a very deep tan. Huge, fat lips. Eyes were squinted and huge. There was hair on and around the face, but it was sparse in that area. It was slightly bent over when it was looking up at me. When it was finished with the stare down, it stood up straight as can be, seemed to take a deep breath and squared up its shoulders and walked down the trail it was on in the first place. The creature went on its way like the situation never happened. Didn't look back, make a sound, nothing. Not concerned about the witness at all. As he mentioned, when he did finally climb down out of the tree, he went over to where the creature was standing. He determined from the height of the underbrush and low-hanging branches that it was indeed not a human. It was what he thought in the first place, a Sasquatch. It was not and could not have been a man. I have camped and investigated this area, and it is quite active. The witness is as honest and as down-to-earth as just about anyone I have met inside and outside the scope of this subject matter. 
The following story is Tommy's first encounter. It occurred October 17, 2014, in Reynolds County, Missouri. Me, my uncle, and son was bow hunting for deer and had set up a camp alongside a food plot that the state park had planted for the wildlife. The day was October the 17th, 2014, at approximately 10 p.m. We were at camp sitting around the campfire when these whoops and low growls started happening around us. My uncle went into the camper and got his mag flashlight, which produced a very bright light, and started scanning the food plot. As he was scanning it, we saw this reflection which resembled a light shining off of a mirror. Now, the reflection came from behind a treetop or brush pile. When we saw it, the whole treetop began to shake and move around. Soon the treetop stopped moving, and then we heard these footsteps moving through the woods behind the food plot. Well, fear soon set in, and we all made our way to the camper, went in, and locked the door behind us. After an hour or so, I had to bleed my bladder like something fierce. However, after what I saw, I refused to go outside by myself. So with a little persuasion, my uncle and son decided to go out with me. Almost immediately, the whoops, howls, and the low growls started up. My uncle just could not resist himself, so the flashlight came on and started scanning the field again. After my business was complete, I parked myself beside the fire while my son and uncle done some more investigating. All of a sudden, hands started waving, and the call, Come here, come here, was told to me. Still afraid and shaken up by the previous experience, I wasn't too interested in what they were seeing. However, I made my way over to them to see what was going on. But for some reason, I just could not see what they were seeing. Look there by the tree. See it? See it? Soon I saw this movement, like an arm sliding down the tree, and behold, there it was, a Bigfoot. Oh my God, I could not believe it. There standing beside this white oak tree, this massive creature was standing there with his right arm wrapped around this tree, trying to blend in with it, I guess. The next morning we went and hunted again, and on our way back to camp, my son and I stopped on what we have named Bigfoot Ridge, because every time we hunt there, these Bigfoots just will not leave us alone so we can hunt. However, a BFRO expedition was in progress there, led by Ron. My son and I stopped by to see if they were still there, and thank God he was. We told him what had happened. He followed us back to our campsite and done his own investigation, which included measuring what we had seen, and the creature stood approximately seven and a half feet. All my life I have heard tales of Bigfoots, personal experiences, and never believed that I myself would ever see one. Now I have. BFRO investigator Carter Bouchard spoke with the witness, and this is his report. I have spent a good deal of time with this witness, Campton ran night ops with he and his family members mentioned in this report, and fellow investigators. He, they, have had several encounters, and his stories ring true and never waver. We were in the very general area when he had the sighting mentioned in this report, literally a mile or so away. They hunt and fish to feed their family, not really for sport. They feel the squatches come around to try and steal their game they have worked so hard for, and they are both shocked and frustrated by the seemingly constant visitations. As hunters and fishermen, they have a knack for picking some really great areas, and these would be considered very squatchy by any knowledgeable investigators. I could not pick any better areas for night ops than they picked to hunt. I had a visual sighting through my thermal less than a mile from their campsite. Myself, Ron Boyles, and Greg Stade, all investigators, had met the witness and previously mentioned family members last year. We went camping with them at another location where they had endured a night of multiple creatures circling their camp, trying to get at their kill of wild pig and deer. We were cut short on our night ops by an ice storm approaching the area. Very credible witnesses, all of them. This report event occurred during my fall 2014 expedition and my entire group was on hand to run night ops in the immediate vicinity of his encounter. Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.